Thanks so much. So I was asked to come here on Wednesday. So I was thinking, what, what's missing here? What could I add? And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about fundraising from the entrepreneur point of view. Last year at Slush, we announced our latest seed round for a company I co-founded, Sun & Coffee. We make instant coffee that tastes really, really good. And we're based in San Francisco. Uh, and to date, we've raised $3.4 million from a variety of top tier VCs, including uh, Y Combinator. We were in the Winter 17 batch earlier this year, and Charles River Ventures and, and the local Lifeline Ventures year. And I thought that it could be interesting, um, at least for me, to actually see how a pitch that sort of raised this amount of money might look like. So I thought of, of giving you the, the pitch and a, sort of a little bit of background. Um, I left Sudden a couple months ago. The company's still doing really well. My co-founder is running it, and, and I'm still, uh, as a shareholder, involved. And yeah, so here we go. So basically, here's the thing. Everybody loves good coffee, right? Who here doesn't like good coffee? Now, few love instant coffee. I mean, this is the sort of gnarly stuff that you end up getting in airplanes when you're waiting at a dentist office and so on. And it's basically just liquid coffee that's dehydrated. But here's the thing. Instant coffee is the king when you look at the coffee market. It's a $35 billion market. Imagine that, out of the $85 billion that coffee is worldwide. And there hasn't been any innovation in the past, what, 50 years, basically since Nescafe came out. Then on the other hand, the consumer interest is trending heavily towards the high quality specialty coffee um, that's served in here as well. Uh, that's the sort of much more differentiated, much more interesting um, approach to coffee. And on average, the millennial consumers spend $80 in coffee per month, which is a lot of money. Now, here's what we wanted to make. Instant coffee that you'll actually want to drink. I was sitting on a plane, I was really desperate for some caffeine, and I had a coffee and it was horrible. And I thought, is there a way I could have good coffee right here? So why not make instant coffee that would actually taste good? It's basically liquid coffee that's dehydrated. So we approached it by making, taking good coffee, brewing it well, and not screwing it up, essentially. So basically, it's about combining the convenience and all the good things of, of instant coffee. It's super light, has a huge shelf life, uh, it's cheap to transport, easy to use, it's designed to scale with all the best aspects of specialty coffee. Great branding, uh, great taste, high margin, um, and that it's growing rapidly. And as you can see, it's like two huge markets overlapping. So far, we have customers who absolutely love it. We have an amazing amount of, of basically shares on social media. And the, the demand is showing pretty strong organic growth. Now, we redacted the numbers, but these are still the, the sort of graphs are actually what we had in the pitch. And we also have a really good team. My background is, is heavily in coffee. Before I got into startups, I ran a bunch of coffee shops at Slush. Three years ago, we served all the coffee that was served here, uh, about 22,000 cups uh, throughout seven, seven cafes throughout the event, and also studied food science at University of Helsinki. Then my co-founder, Josh, is Stanford industrial engineering grad, uh, spent a lot of time at McKinsey optimizing factories, and we have a scientific advisor who's basically the world's leading coffee scientist um, who is helping us making, making good coffee. He was the head of taste and aroma at Nespresso, which is a pretty cool title. Now, that was basically the pitch we pitch investors um, when we raised this about 2.7 million round. And for our first round, which was half a mil, it was basically the same, but with fewer numbers. But the, the market was market research was same, and the, and the validation for the product was same. Now, keep in mind that this is sort of my experience is limited to this one, one company and one race when it comes to raising money for a startup. Uh, so the N is, is one. And also, I think that a really important thing to keep in mind when you're an entrepreneur is that um, you know your company best. People will give you advice. You can hear about things. But take it all with a grain of salt. 
nobody has the full context of the company the same way you do. I've been screwed many times when I listen to somebody who doesn't really know what they're talking about, but they're really confident in saying like, oh, you guys should do this, absolutely. And then it turns out to be a horrible, horrible idea. And now I think I want to sort of try to deconstruct this and share some of the factors that I thought made this a successful uh, race. And, and I think the three, quick, three key questions that we knew investors would be asking and, and that we wanted to answer were basically, is what you're making something that a lot of people need or want, ideally need? And this is basically, is there a market for what you're doing? Um, is it something that a lot of people love and want to pay for it? And at that point, we basically, this is the market. Once I showed this slide, nobody's questioning uh, if there's market for specialty coffee um, or specialty instant coffee. Where there's two huge markets, we have a product that's overlapping, we're first to that market, and I don't need to put a number there. Anybody can figure out that any sort of overlap will probably be pretty, pretty significant. And then secondly is basically second part is the traction. So when you're raising money for a company, the best way to raise money is to make your company better. So the more traction you have, uh, the more sort of confidence that builds in your ability to execute and, and sell that product and also prove that people like what you're doing. And in our case, for the second, second raise, we had been um, shipping product for about a year and we had very sort of strong organic growth. And secondly, you want to answer the question, why is your company in the top 5% in the world to solve this problem? Why are you the best team to solve this problem? Early stage startups are essentially a function of its founders. If the founders are great, they can probably overcome a lot of obstacles and barriers and make things work. You can have a great idea and a mediocre team, and it'll probably turn out to be something mediocre, or you're going to have great founders and an OK idea, but the great founders will probably turn it into a great idea sooner or later. And, and in our case, this is a photo from my first barista competitions. I've, I'm a two-time Finnish barista champion before I embarked on my startup career and, and was ranked as the ninth best barista in the world. And then also, I've been involved in Slush since 2011 and also studied food science. And then we have my co-founder, who is a really like, incredible operations geek and amazing at optimizing uh, sort of physical production environments. And then we have this scientist who is the world's leading authority in figuring out how to build something like this. So it's a team of very sort of complementary um, overlapping skills that a lot of investors said that that's basically like why they wanted to back this, um, since there's sort of strong proof that we can make this actually happen. And I think thirdly is why, what prevents from somebody else doing this? How is this defensible? And in the case of Sudden, sure, um, Nestle could do this, but they don't know how to market it. We sell it online as a subscription uh, to consumers in the US, which is very disruptive in the instant coffee space. Um, and, and sort of a lot of people wouldn't realize that. So it's a combination for us, a combination of factors of, it's very, it, it requires a lot of skill, it's hard to make it, it's hard to scale it, uh, and the barrier of entry is fairly high. Um, so that's also something you'd want to bring in. And then I think some sort of more tactical general tips for fundraising based on my experience and, and what I've seen and, and learned at Y Combinator. And this is something that I really love and, and I'm a really big fan of, being positively weird. And by that, I mean something that a VC or an investor who sees 100 pitches a day um, at best remembers. And in our YC batch, there were 112 companies, I think. And I could bet quite a bit of money on it that we were probably one of the most rememberable ones. The guys that make instant coffee that looks kind of like drugs. Uh, so you want to take advantage of that sort of being positively weird in a good sense. Uh, it makes it easier for people to talk about you, for other people to pitch you. Um, I can give somebody a tube and say, like, this is our instant coffee, and you can give it to others. It's really easy to remember. You can go to somebody's office and you see it there, like, oh, what's that? It's really hard to do that for a 
you know, your regular B2B SaaS app. Um, you can usually find a way to do that. And if you can, I definitely embrace that as a, as a key differentiator. And then basically, fundraising is about creating FOMO. <laughs> so fear of missing out. Momentum is your friend. That's what you want to build. And so at YC, they recommend you to say no to all investor meetings and say that we're just heads down building our product because the best way to raise more money is to make your company better. The more attraction you have, uh, the more track record you have, the better. The more paying customers you have, the less money you need uh, to raise. And so basically, um, not taking any investor meetings and then having a, like a, a week or two week period where you book all the investor meetings back to back and you become you work on to become the hot new deal in town. The one that everyone's talking about. And uh, I read this quote the other day that nowadays all the deals are, um, how was it? So basically, uh, they're really undersubscribed until they become hugely oversubscribed. So nobody wants to be the first to give you the money. But once you have somebody, everybody wants to be in. So it's about creating that momentum and creating that FOMO for investors um, for the deal. And, and that can sort of really uh, make it a much more shorter and efficient um, project for you to raise the money so you can get back to what you actually want to be doing, which is building your company. And then lastly, you're only looking for a market of one yes. You basically, most of the time, need that one investor who's going to say yes. There are a lot of companies who've pitched to a lot of investors um, who've said no so many times until they find one company and become a huge success. So don't give up. Keep going. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, and now you can see questions in front of you um, from Slido. So the first question from Daniel is how difficult is it to copy the product and enter the market, uh, maybe outside of the US. I would say that uh, it's pretty hard to copy the product. Uh, we work on it for a very long time. Uh, part of the proof is that nobody's done it yet, um, at least nowhere near as good as, as ours is. And so I think it's definitely doable. And, and I don't think it's, uh, when you're creating a new market with your product, which is basically the case for us, we're the first premium instant coffee that is on the market. And uh, it might sound a little counterintuitive, but at some point you do want competitors as well, because that validates the market. If you're first to the market and then all of a sudden, you know, like Nestle and all these other big players are coming to the market, that's amazing validation for you. That proves that you've found a market niche that these other big players realize can be a big thing. But at that point, you're also so far in the product development that you have a huge head start, and you can keep iterating and owning a large proportion of that market when the big boys are basically uh, growing the pie for you, is, is, is how we think it. But it's, it's not something that we're worried about. And again, uh, one of the sort of YC mantras is that startups don't get killed. Um, they, they commit a suicide most of the time. So the vast majority of startups don't die because of competition or sort of external factors, but because the team falls apart or something else happens. Why did I go to the uh, US? So it was a variety of, of, of factors, <laughs> partly because I really wanted to get out of Helsinki and, and not living in snow. Uh, so California seemed lucrative. Uh, San Francisco is a great hub for technology and coffee both. And um, I knew that we'd need to raise more funding than would be available for us here. And frankly, there's not the type of technology in terms of food um, science and so on just available in the Nordics, um, although it is in the US. And that's, again, one of, the, one of the things of being positively weird, being in San Francisco, is is the fact that it's a tech company, it's a, it's a tech city, and then all of a sudden there's this coffee company that goes to YC and, and makes these tubes of coffee. We have a factory in San Francisco. 
and, and it makes it, sure, it's a little more expensive than somewhere else, but it makes it so much more rememberable and so much more interesting. It's kind of like um, a juxtaposition, which is a great when you're pitching it to journalists, for example. So I, I, don't, I don't say that, I definitely don't think that going to US is a prerequisite for something or um, uh, will make your life so much easier. It depends. If I'd started a gaming company, I probably wouldn't go to San Francisco. It doesn't make sense. Um, and uh, in terms of getting funding in Nordic, um, Lifeline is one of our first investors, but most of our other money uh, came from, from the US. So I can't really talk about fundraising in the Nordics, um, except that I've helped some other uh, startups raise funding here, and I'm doing some angel investing myself now as well, and um, it's definitely quite a bit harder here. It's harder to create that FOMO and that momentum because there's, so, there's just fewer investors, and it's harder to find that one yes among a smaller group. So how much equity does the team still own after all these rounds? I mean, that depends on, obviously, the valuations and how you structure them. Uh, we don't disclose the sort of valuations uh, that we uh, take the investment in, but there are some sort of general outlines um, that you can find online, how much teams usually own after a seed round or so on. Um, so yeah, I don't really want to delve into that. Did you notice difference between American and Nordic investors? Um, to a certain extent, yes. I don't have a ton of experience with Nordic investors. In terms of US investors, I think they um, see a lot more deals, uh, can be a lot more professional, especially angel investors. Uh, it, it's just the fact of being in San Francisco where there's so much more happening, so much more deal flow, that they're usually uh, quicker to move and maybe are willing to take uh, bigger risks on, on new products. Where to start selling coffee in Helsinki? Um, unfortunately, nowhere right now. So we're focused only in the US market now. Uh, it's really hard to ship it. We, we did ship uh, internationally in the beginning, but it turns out when you ship brown powder in like tubes, a lot of customs get interested. So a lot of packages got missing and got stuck somewhere. So we uh, decided not to do it, and it was just more of a hassle. How do you define the perfect investor? Frankly, really, the main thing that you get from investors is money. So many investors advertise themselves as smart money. Nobody wants to be dumb money. But still, uh, and, and, and that's like what a lot of the top investors would tell you. Um, I was just watching Steve Jurvetson's talk from Slush last year, where he said that uh, if any investor tells you like at, at, he said that at most investors are sort of your um, best cheerleaders. And if they tell you more, or uh, they're probably lying, or something along those lines. So it, it's good not to be sort of too, uh, I don't know, soft or idealistic about it. It's, it's mainly money. They can help you with their Rolodex, so introductions, hiring. And in some cases, if they have like a deep um, knowledge or substance in your field, maybe more in terms of like super angels, um, let's say you've started a, a wearable company and, and somebody who's done misfits before is probably a great angel investor for you. But I don't think there's sort of the perfect investor. So did we have a product when we entered YC or only a concept? Uh, we did. We actually applied to YC four times and only got in on the fourth time because uh, they viewed as a... Uh, basically the first ever food production company that's got an end. Uh, but the big, big sort of picture um, we had for Saturn is to become a technology company. So we did have a product, we did have a pretty strong growth already, and, and most of the time YC is uh, heading to the direction now, at least what it seems to me can talk for them, but um, looking for teams who already have some traction and have validated that what they're making is, is scalable and interesting and some people actually want it. What is my favorite book that's taught me most about business? That's a good question. I am a big fan of Ben Horowitz's Hard Thing About Hard Things. I think it's a, it's a must read for any uh, startup founder. 
uh, it's, it's Dale Carnegie's what, book about, uh, it's a really classic one. Basically, it's, it's a tacky name, so like how to make friends and be successful or something like that. But um, it's, a, it's a really good one. And then one of the things, one of the books recently that I read that I've really liked is, is Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci's biography by Walter Isaacson that just came out and highlighting the importance of curiosity in doing anything. And I think it's hugely important for uh, a startup founder to be curious, to be learning all the time, uh, to be asking questions, and also to be interested in, when you run a startup, you want to be very focused on what you're doing, but you want to be curious about your customers, about how they use your product, how you can make it better for them, um, and ask a lot of questions, and talk to your customers to make your product um, a lot better. Is selling coffee ethical? Yes, we source the coffee uh, directly from the farms with a roasting partner who, who we really um, know and trust. So um, it, it is as eth ethical as, as coffee gets, basically. All right, I think we're out of time. Thanks for listening to everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your slush. If you have more questions, uh, feel free to email me. My email is, is frezekale. Uh, Last name, first name, at gmail.com. Happy to help. Thanks. And that's it. Thank you so much, Kale. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Kale.